Accutron Watches present. From New York City, this is the Accutron Show, a time travel through American culture with your hosts, Bill McCuddy, Scott Alexander, and David Graver. Visit AccutronWatch.com and discover the brand that has made American history with an all-new proprietary next-generation electrostatic energy movement. Accutron. It's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. So when you think that the brand is the boss, you are working for the brand and you are respecting the brand because he's the boss. The person you heard at the top of the show is watchmaking legend Jean-Claude Biver. He's joining us from the south of France. Meanwhile, back here in the good old U.S. of A., it's me, Bill McCuddy, along with David Graver and Scott Alexander. We're talking watches with one of the men who was there at the very beginning of some of the most important brands in the world. This is the Accutron Show. Stay tuned. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our iconic Space View 2020 collection, recreating the stunning visual impact of the original open dial design combined with an all new electrostatic energy movement. Time just changed again. The Accutron Space View 2020. Join us in celebrating Accutron's birthday. On October 25th, the iconic Empire State Building will illuminate in Accutron's signature green hue. Don't miss out in seeing the view. One of the turning points of my young life was going to a James Bond movie and seeing that Bond had traded in his Rolex for an Omega. And the guy we're going to meet today is sort of instrumental in putting that together. He is, as I mentioned at the top, a watchmaking legend. And he's been at the forefront of tons of brands out there. We don't always talk about watches on this show, but today we're doing a deep diver into uh, Jean-Claude Bipier. And I want to know... Did he put the poison darts in? <laughs> <laughs> was, that was, that was, he was part of... He was in that trunk with uh, Hervé Villachez. He was... Uh, it was, uh, it was, no, I'm, I'm not everywhere. kidding. That was an amazing thing because yeah. it was the first time as a kid I realized, oh, James Bond is wearing a new watch. Yeah. I, better, I better run out and buy one of those. And we're going to ask him about whether it actually did anything. For sale. Yeah, the lady year old Bill was like, I'm going to go buy an Omega. <laughs> I bet that laid out the format for what people do with brand partnerships today, especially with celebrities and films. And I, I imagine it did contribute substantially to sales and awareness. But this gentleman has done that for brand after brand after brand. Yeah, it's really bonkers. Well, the funny thing is, and, and I'll let you complete that thought in a moment, but the, what you said about like the beginning of brand placement and product placement is that there was tons of it in Bond movies, but nothing was as, and I hate to say the word classy, but nothing was as cool as the watch on his, you know, maybe the cigar he smoked, and of course the Aston Martin he drove, but then it was 7 up. Up and Heineken and all these other things, but the watch he wore was iconic to me as a kid because, and I think our guest will agree, uh, the watch has, it, it's a part of you and it's its a statement about who you are. Yeah, I mean, it is it is one of the few pieces of jewelry that a man is acceptably wearing and, and when you have that hyper-masculine James Bond sort of image and you say like, and what jewelry does he wear? He wears that watch, he wears that brand. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, you need more piercings. That's, you're yeah, right about that. I need to, yeah, <laughs> mine and leather, I think. Yeah. Uh, Omega, let's talk about it. Omega, uh, Blanc Pond, which was basically in mothballs Indeed. when right. they brought it out for like 60,000 or 80,000 22,000 Swiss francs. Swiss francs and I think they made a little That's on unbelievable. That. The I whole brand cost 22,000 Swiss francs and I think he sold it for 60 million? Yeah. We'll ask, wow. we'll ask if that <laughs> was the right decision. We'll also talk about <laughs> we'll yeah, you think? We'll also talk about who blow uh the Big Bang, also Tag Heuer he was involved with uh LVMH. Well, I love I love that he was in the industry for a really interesting period. I think he enters in like the 80s or maybe the 70s, and he's there in the 80s, 90s, the aughts, and it's this time where you've got not just these new technologies for like watches and the kind of height of sort of mass market watches, but then you've got technology coming in digital and then Apple watches and these things. And so he's really stayed with these brands that are connected back to the original watchmaking. He, he you know, trained in... The Alps. Right, he, right. You know, he's he's from Switzerland. He's he's, he's also you know, a farmer. He makes right, cheese. He's the he real drinks deal. wine. I think he drives an old Ferrari. But it feels like this was a time when those brands 
could have those values could have been lost in the 80s 90s like technology kind of goes no we have a better way we have a better way it was like yeah. well we quartz don't. rolex made a quartz rolex made a right. quartz watch i mean they were everybody almost drank that kool-aid and uh we're going to ask him about that about uh, bringing back handmade by by artisans watches and yeah. his perception of it all because was was quartz the enemy is quartz an enemy today for those of us who love a movement that differs, be it mechanical or electrostatic. And will we always wear a mechanical watch on our wrist, or uh, is the Apple Watch really the devil, I, and is okay. it going to change I, I everything? Have a, I have a hot take. Okay. Apple Watch is not a watch. Okay. Okay? It's not a watch. A Apple has been selling oh, it's this a bracelet. Like, exactly. Well, it's, it's a, a bangle. It's a, it's it's a, a bangle. Star. It's your computer <laughs> on your... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a Star Trek communicator. You know? There's a whole generation, it's a I phone. guess like a five or six years younger than you, that <laughs> believes that we're only going to wear it's a Apple distraction. Watches. It just It's 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 constantly telling you, hey, 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 hey. It's not... No, no thank Why you. Why do you wear a watch? Why do I wear a watch? It's a really important question that every single person has to ask when they get up in the morning. If you like to wear a watch, I love to wear a watch, and I but, like it for its identity, for its aesthetic purpose. I love the idea that it it keeps time for itself. But a watch I don't use is it for, for time. telling time. Exactly what I mean. <laughs> the least important function in an Apple Watch is the time. You know, there are lots so of we places. We have time everywhere. Right, exactly. We, because we, there are so many places. But we a can watch find the is time. for one thing. It is for telling time. It is for like it goes back. This goes back to this ancient desire in in humankind to take this. This, these long expanses and how do we divide them and the, can we make some sense of our lives? Like time is one of those really fundamental things to the human experience and the idea of market goes back to Stonehenge. You know, yeah. it goes back to like... The cavemen that, that wore the little sundial on their wrists. <laughs> I don't think a watch is for telling time anymore. I think a watch is for completing um, your personality, for having an extension of yourself that you feel like it aligns sort of with your values and I, I could look elsewhere to tell the time, but if I want to represent something about myself, mm. I could put it on my wrist and I can feel kind of confident about that. <laughs> no one represents time better than our next guest. Jean-Claude Biver joins us right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our Accutron DNA collection. Reimagined for a new generation, the Accutron DNA combines breakthrough technology, precise engineering, and modern aesthetics to achieve a new level of technical excellence. The Accutron DNA, the new face of time for those who blaze new trails. Jean-Claude, welcome to the Accutron Show. We are here in New York, and we are looking at you someplace across uh, the pond. Where are you right now? I'm in uh, Ramatuel, which is a little village next to Saint-Tropez in the south of France. Uh, it's good to be you. <laughs> <laughs> But in fact, it's been good to be you for a long time, because if this country had an ambassador of style or taste, you would absolutely be the guy we would want in that role. You are a farmer, uh, a, a vintner, uh, you enjoy all great things, and watches happens to be your passion. Where did that start? What was the very first watch on your wrist that you remember? Uh, I was eight years old, and uh, my grandfather gave me a wonderful Omega Constellation watch. And I wore it to go to church to because we were Catholics for my first communion. And coming back from church, I had to give the watch back, put in the safe. And when I was 18, they gave me the watch again. And I was so happy to have the watch when I was 18. I wear it all the time. And I went skiing with the watch. And at a certain moment, the watch had gone. It was no more on my wrist. I lost the watch while skiing. And the watch uh, had an engravement of my name and the name of my grandfather. And that gave me an extraordinary emotion. Not the fact that I had a watch, but the fact that I lost the watch. And that was my first uh, relation uh, with watches. I realized that the watch is not necessarily something to tell you what time it is. It is also a piece of emotion. It's a piece of art. It's a piece of beauty. 
Uh, it's a piece of love, it's a piece of culture, it's a piece of tradition, it's a piece of status, etc., etc. And that is, uh, so I can say, it started at eight when I got the watch just for the church and then back to the safe. And then <laughs> it went on at 18 when I had the watch on the wrist and I was so stupid to go skiing with it that I lost it. So that's my start in watchmaking. <laughs> <laughs> this very powerful emotional experience with losing a watch, did you channel those emotions into work you did with any of the brands that you helped rejuvenate down the line? Did you put that emotion somewhere into the work? Uh, I tried to put a uh, soul in a watch. You know, when you buy a luxury product, the least you expect is that there's not only technology or technique, uh, but there must be a soul. And soul cannot come from machine. A machine cannot produce soul. Uh, only, the only uh, way to get soul into a product, into an object, is through your hands, through your fingers. And only a human being can give birth uh, to a product with soul. And that was always my ambition. I don't say I always achieved it, but my ambition was to give to my watches a soul. And when you give to your watch a soul, that means you are also communicating with the person who buys the watch. Because the person who buys and is going to wear the watch, he will feel, but not being necessarily conscious, but he will feel something and he will not be able to tell you that's the soul of the watch, but nevertheless, it is the soul. So that was my ambition all the time. And even today, and today I, I preach to people and I say, come on, stop looking at your watch to, to know what time it is. Look at your watch for other reasons. If you only look to your watch to see what time it is, it, why would you wear a watch? Because to know what time it is, you can have a phone, you can have a computer, you're everywhere. So there must be another function. And all these other functions, which are not rational, and whatever is not rational is beautiful. We are, we are, we are fed up with rationality. We want dreams, we want emotions. Uh, the rational things, we have enough. So <laughs> at least if you wear on your body one element that takes you away from rationality, that's brilliant. And if the watch can make you dream, so wear it and look at it. And each time you look at it, you have, you have dreams. And the dream, because it's the watch that your, 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 your fiancé gave you or the watch that your parents gave you, whatever. But the, the beauty of the watch is that it helps us uh, during the day to dream and not only dreaming in the night. We need dreams during the day because when we dream in the night, we, we even don't realize that we are dreaming. But dreaming in the day, that's luxury. So Jean-Claude, are you saying the Apple Watch has no soul? I say the Apple Watch has a wonderful, exceptional technology the Apple Watch has a lot of sense. It makes sense to wear one. Uh, it gives you a lot of information about uh, you, about your health, about your your day, uh, your day. Uh, but I don't know if the Apple Watch has a soul. When you produce, uh, I don't know how many thirty million pieces. Uh, I think uh, it's mostly made by machine and not so much by by fingers of watchmaker masters. I think it's more difficult to get the soul in it. But it all depends who, how, how did you get it? If, if it is the present of, uh, uh, of, your, of your fiancé, or it's the first present of your daughter, and she, uh, because you are now 50, and, and for the 50th anniversary, uh, she saved money, and she bought you a wonderful Apple Watch. So that is a way to have an Apple Watch with soul because you got it from your daughter and it's the first present she made to you with her own pocket money. 
it's uh, it's so funny to think about uh, that soul, that irrationality. I love that idea. And, and we think of uh, Switzerland and the Swiss in particular as being such hyper rational uh, people. And the idea that the birthplace of really you know modern watch movements being in Switzerland, it seems it seems like almost a contradiction that you're saying it's actually an irrational soul based thing. How how do you think that comes out of the Swiss culture? You know the 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 the, the Swiss culture comes uh, has been influenced by the uh, by the geography of the country and the geography of the country. Uh, 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 you will see that there are a lot of mountains, and uh, whoever lives in the mountains has another mentality than people who are living uh, in in the in the cities. And uh, 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 people from the mountain are usually very romantic. They, they like singing. They are close to nature. And if you are close to nature, you are somehow close to God. And if you are close to God, you are somehow close to eternity. And that gives you a total different sense of your life. Because if you get suddenly connected, to eternity, that's where we want all to go. And uh, I think uh, we, we got this mentality thanks to our people who were living in the mountains, uh, who were singing, dreaming, uh, 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 and that that is just beautiful and I just love it. And I always say, the closer you are to nature, the closer you are to God, because I don't believe somehow in God. I believe in nature. And uh, for me, God means nature. God means uh, a planet Earth. And, uh, 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 and that is, for me, my way also to find a refugee in something. And it's my God. My God are my trees. My God are my mountains. My God is my sea. Uh, uh, and every day I go to the forest, whether uh, uh, in, in Switzerland or here in Ramatuel, I have a big property with a lot of trees and I find my uh, strength together with the trees. I go and I embrace the tree and I say, hey, you are here for 400 years. Give me a little bit of your strength. Give me a little bit uh, uh, of, your, of, your, yeah, of your force. And that is something um, that makes me and gives me my equilibrium. I love that. I love that idea of um, of these time spans being so long and the idea of eternity and then sort of this almost yin-yangness of, of dividing eternity with watchmaking, with marking time inside of eternity, um, these two kind of sides of yes. the, uh, the finite and the infinite. I'm very curious, while you were there championing mechanical watches and evidence of the hand and work of the hand, did you ever think of the quartz movement as an enemy? The soul robber. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not against the quartz watch. If I would be against the quartz watch, I would behave like an ayatollah. <laughs> I'm not an ayatollah. I'm open. I'm very open-minded. And every technology is welcome and should be respected. The only thing is that quartz is, has nothing to do uh, with uh, art. It's not, it doesn't come from the watchmaking art. It comes from the technology. Quartz is an extraordinary invention, an extraordinary cre creativity of our engineers. But, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, the mastering of your hands, of your fingers. It has nothing to do with the watchmaking art. It is just a wonderful, uh, very reliable, high quality product. And uh, in that sense, I believe you can even wear bows. Why, why should I always wear uh, a piece of art on my wrist? Not necessarily. I can also wear a quartz watch or my, my uh, 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 connected watch, I am open to both. The only thing is that the quartz watch uh, or the connected watches are due 
to become one day obsolete. One day, I don't know when, maybe in 10 years. Maybe in 10 years, your, uh, your iPhone will be obsolete. Maybe in five years already, I don't know. But what I know, that your mechanical watch that has been made by, uh, by hand will never be obsolete. In 150 years, you will still be able um, to, to, to have, have the watch. I have a big watch collection of vintage watches. And I remember in 2011, I gave as a present to my wife, uh, Patek Philippe, that was made in 1911. So the watch was 100 years old. And she got the watch uh, in 2011, and she still wears it. It still works because it's connected, like, every, like art. Art is connected to eternity. The art of Mozart is not dead. Mozart is still alive. We never had so many people listening to Mozart than now. <laughs> All his lifetime, he had maybe 1% of the people that are listening now to Mozart after he died. The Beatles are not dead. Picasso is not dead. Art cannot die. Uh, art is connected to eternity. That's why art is so close to God, so close to love. Love is also eternal. Jean -Claude, and that can, yes, I, I want to I want to sort of tie this part of uh, the conversation up and just make one thing clear because before you came along, the three of us were kind of arguing about this. You think we'll always wear a timepiece that's handmade on our wrists? from generation to generation, will never stop. As you just said, we might have an Apple or, or some kind of technical watch on one wrist, but the other wrist will always have a mechanical timepiece, as far as you're concerned. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, you know, you can have uh, uh, pictures and lithography of paintings, but the original painting will always have a, a total different value. Uh, the, uh, 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 since the lithography has been invented, it's wonderful because many people can have access. Uh, but the original piece has always another value. And in that sense, uh, uh, the, the, the mechanical watch is a piece of art, is a piece of eternity. And in that sense, it cannot compete because who competes with eternity? <laughs> God. That's all. Bill McCartney. <laughs> yeah. And what, bra what brand would God wear on his wrist? God wear, wears... <laughs> uh, he doesn't wear a brand. <laughs> because <laughs> if he would wear a brand, he's like you, me, uh, having five kids and telling you which child I like most. I like them all the same. And God loves all the brands. Hey, listen, uh, shifting gears appropriately enough, we're going to talk about all of the brands that you've been associated with. And it's uh, a long list, so we've got a lot to get to. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, there is more from Saint-Tropez with the great Jean-Claude Bivet. We'll be right back. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, AccutronWatch.com and discover our legacy collection. Reviving some of the most memorable Accutron watches from the 60s and 70s, the legacy collection combines timeless design with the technical excellence of Swiss watchmaking, each limited to 600 individually numbered pieces. The Accutron Legacy Collection, inspired by the past, built for the future. Jean-Claude, welcome back. Uh, we were talking in the break and, of course, at the top of the show about all the influences in the watch world. Now, you've been attached to some of the greatest brands uh, from the 60s uh, on, and I wonder, do you, do you have a favorite? Do you have one that you liked more than any other? I mean, you told the great story about the Omega you lost, and then you ended up running the company. Uh, <laughs> was that sort of the perfect revenge, and did they, did they remake the watch that you lost on the ski slope? No, we didn't remake because uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense 
to remake a vintage watch. I lost the watch in uh, probably in the uh, uh, end of the, the 50s. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, and to make a watch that looks like a vintage doesn't uh, make sense. You cannot repeat the past. And you must preserve the past. You can collect the past. But there are tons but, of there are tons of reissues. There are tons of things that are that look like old watches. I mean, we're wearing <laughs> we're wearing Accutrons today that are inspired by the ones from the '60s, and these are the newer releases. I mean, doesn't the past, in some ways, inform the future? Yes. Uh, no past, no future. I always say, or I say better, no tradition, no future. But I add no innovation, no future. It means you need the tradition and you need the innovation. If you just copy, where is the innovation? So your, your accutro of which you are talking about is not a copy. It's an inspiration. It's an interpretation. So in the somehow, it is... Both, it is part, partly a tradition and it is partly an innovation. And that makes sense. But to copy exactly the watch that was lost by me because I was so stupid to go skiing <laughs> wouldn't make sense. Okay. You have turned around so many brands and you have brought shined a new light on so many historic titles that were reborn again. And I'm going to ask for a little bit of insider information, but... If someone were to bring you a brand today and it excited you, how would you start to reintroduce it? I would ask the person who wants to make a brand, or I would ask myself if, I, if, 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 if it would be my idea, what will be the man the brand exists? What is the reason why you exist? What is it? <laughs> so people would say, oh, we make watches. But that's not the reason. We make beautiful watches. That's not the reason. We make high quality watches. That's not the reason. We make expensive watches. But all this is, is just a, 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 a general answer. We make Swiss made watches. Ah, so what? We need a message. What's the message of your brand? And one, uh, one extraordinary example is my adventure or when, uh, when I own uh, Hublot, the brand Hublot. Uh, and when I got into Hublot in 2004, I asked to the uh, majority shareholder, to the owner, what is your message at Hublot? And he couldn't give me an answer. He said, we are doing great watches that are looking like a portal with a rubber strap. I said, brilliant. That's a definition of a product. It's not a definition of your message. And uh, he said, okay, so uh, let's find a message. And I said, yes, I will work on it and I will bring you a message. And which message did I bring to Hublot? I said, Hublot is the fusion between tradition and future. Because Hublot in 1980 came out with a gold watch and a rubber bracelet. And gold and rubber never were together. They were never matching together because people who were buying a gold watch, they didn't want the rubber strap. They wanted a gold strap or eventually a leather strap. And gold is in the mind is under the earth, rubber is on the tree. And the two, in fact, can never meet in nature because whatever is on the tree cannot meet what is under the earth. Only a human being bringing down the rubber from the tree, bringing up from under the earth gold and then mixing it. And this mixture between gold and rubber which Hublot did in 1980, I called it the art of fusion. And from today on, we will have one message in the world of watches. We will represent the art of fusion in watchmaking art. 
Boom. That's it. The that, day worked, that worked out pretty well for you. And the day we had this message, that was end of 2004, we exactly knew why we were existing, but we also exactly knew what we have to do. <laughs> uh, uh, and that is the most important part. Whatever you do, what is the message? What do you represent? <laughs> what is your philosophy? Uh, and once you have defined the message and the philosophy, then you, uh, you, then you must define the product that represents this uh, message. I'm very, it's like, uh, I'm yes, very curious about me. your approach to the people underneath the watch. I, a very personal story. I met you at an event, perhaps 2008, 2009, when I was an assistant in advertising. I sat beside you as a guest. You gave me your card when I was a nobody. I emailed you, and 30 minutes later, you had responded. You said, if I ever needed anything, feel free to reach out. And that stuck with me. You were at And that day has come. He has a huge, <laughs> huge favor to ask you right now. He's no, on his way to San Tropez <laughs> right after this. Your, inten your attention to people is, is very meaningful, especially watches don't exist without people. And I think I would like to understand your understanding of how people make a brand. You know, uh, uh, if, if I answer very quickly uh, uh, your, your phone or your mail, that's only a question of respect. If you respect people... Who are you not to give an immediate response? Who are you to uh, write back a mail three days later? Uh, that's not me. I am, I am respectful of anybody who calls me or who wants to have a, 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 an answer from me. I try to answer immediately because that's why... Uh, uh, um, the message exists. L uh, 50 years ago, we had no message. We had two ways to communicate, either by letter and then by post. Then you expect an answer after one week. And then we had the telefax, uh, where people were expecting an answer, uh, a telegram, sorry, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, eight hours. And then came uh, uh, the message, uh, internet message, where we expect the answer in a, in a few hours. And that is a question of respect. And, you know, I also, uh, 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 when people were writing uh, an information to Hublot, info at hublot.com, info at hublot.com, where did this mail come? All the info at Hublot.com, they came to me. <laughs> they came to me because I wanted to know who is knocking at my door. And I had hundreds of mail every day because, and I were able to look at them in a few seconds. It didn't take me so much time, but it took me at least one hour per day. But thanks to this, I immediately got the temperature of my brand. Uh, I said a few times to my people, let's go uh, in three nights, let's go to the cemetery of the village or the city. People said, why should we go to the cemetery? I said, because in the cemetery, we have hundreds of dead people who gave their love, who gave their passion, and who gave a part of their life to, uh, to us, to our brand. And they, some were born in 1815, others in 1840, etc. So in the cemetery, we have a few hundred of people that worked for our brand long before us. And if we go to the cemetery and we stay silent and we listen, we might get a message from these people. These people might connect to us and they will talk to us. Of course, they will not talk uh, like, like I'm talking to you now, <laughs> but we will, get, <laughs> we will get a feeling. And the cemetery 
is, is not silent. The silent is apparently it is silent, but they are talking. You have an atmosphere. You can imagine what all these people, they have worked so many hours. They have given us so many hours of passion. That leaves a trace. It's like love. Love leaves a trace. Love never disappears. So, uh, 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 and I said to my people, we go, we stay one evening at 10 o'clock, we go to the cemetery. And they came, and in the beginning, they said, what a crazy idea. But once we went back on the next day, they said, wow, Mr. Beaver, now we understand. So it, for me, that has always been the person, the soul, love, has been more important than anything else. We've talked a lot about now the the philosophy and the feeling and what a watch does. I have some specific questions now, and I think the other guys do too. So let's call this more or less the lightning round. How did you get James Bond to stop wearing Rolex and start wearing an Omega? And what did that do for sales? For sales, it was a miracle. <laughs> it was an exceptional boost. It was an incredible boost for Omega. Uh, we, 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 the the, the uh, James Bond watch, uh, the quantities were multiplied by 10. <laughs> we, we have been selling 10 times more than before. Uh, it was a fantastic boost. And we got, in fact, the Omega uh, to James Bond. I cannot say that we took the place of Rolex because uh, for Omega, it was a sponsorship. We sponsored it. And while, um, uh, while Rolex, I don't think they sponsored it. It means Rolex didn't do anything to promote it. it they just were happy that James Bond was wearing an Omega, uh, a Rolex. And on the contrary, at Omega, we made the deal with uh, the producer and uh, we exploited, we tried to make everybody know that James Bond was wearing a, a, an Omega. We said to ourselves, let's tell all the people that James Bond is wearing a, an Omega before you had to go to the movie and you had to see what the guy was wearing in order to know it was a Rolex. But we suddenly, we said that even if you wouldn't go to the cinema, you would know that James Bond was wearing a... a, a, a so we, we somehow did a dealer, a, a sponsorship a deal uh, with James Bond. And we took James Bond like an ambassador. We did the same later on with Cindy Crawford. With Cindy Crawford, we did the same. Suddenly, she became a designer for Omega. She, she was involved in Omega. She was doing press conferences for Omega. She was not just a nice a picture that we are putting into the newspaper or into Vogue, etc. No, she was active. Your career was used by Harvard as an academic case study because of your deserved but tremendous success. I'm curious, is there something you would have done differently all these years? Is there something you wish you had done? If I would die and God would ask me, are you ready? Are you ready? Do you want to have a second life, which I can offer you now? Because you were such a brave man, I offer you a second life. And I would say, oh, yes, thank you very much. I'm extremely interested to have a second life. And then God would say, okay, the deal is done. You will get a second life. How do you want the second life to be? And I would answer, oh, God, please give me 100% the same life. 100% the same thing. 100% disillusions, 100% the same mistakes, 100% the same failures, 100% I don't want anything to be changed. If you cannot do that, then don't give me a second life. Wow. You'd buy more paddocks for the private collection, I bet. 
Uh, <laughs> you, you've mentioned soul, and and uh, obviously you're a collector of of wine, of watches. Are there any other categories of of items, collectible items that you feel like have a particularly high soul quotient? Uh, yes, I I love art in general. So I I, I buy some paintings, I buy some sculptures, uh, uh, and I love also shoes. So I buy shoes. <laughs> What's shoes, in your garage? I, <laughs> yeah, and I, I I buy some. Yes, I have also bought. I forgot to mention this. I have bought also a few a few vintage cars, uh, which for me have a soul. Exactly. Mm. You know, when I'm driving a, a 1967 uh, uh, GTB uh, uh, 750, uh, two, uh, 275, I, I have really the impression, wow, it's not, <laughs> it's not an electric car. You know, it, it, has a special, it has a special feeling. It has a special, uh, you can always smell when you open the door of a vintage car, you have the smell of leather, a leather that is 70 years old. Wow. Uh, and it's, leaking it's an gasoline. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love cars, I love shoes, I love wine. I, I love life, I love people, I love cheese. And this is also a passion that I have, uh, that I got thanks to the watchmaking art, because the watchmaking art, is in fact born in farmhouses in Switzerland. And the farmers, before making watches, they were making cheese. And uh, uh, so uh, the cheese is probably, the uh, every watchmaker in 1680, uh, 1715, uh, every watchmaker was at the same time a farmer. And they were farming in summer, and making watches in, in winter. Uh, so uh, one day I said to my wife, it's time, I would like to buy a farmhouse and I would like to connect to the origin of my passion. And the origin of my passion goes back to 1650 uh, when the, the first farmers start, uh, started to make watches in, in, in winter. And I want to, a farmhouse and I want to make cheese. And if I do that, I'm back at the beginning of my passion. I'm back to 1650. So we bought a farmhouse and uh, we have been making uh, 9,000 kilo of cheese. And uh, since uh, 2004, the Christmas presents of Rimlo have been my cheese. And I have offered <laughs> 9,000 kilo cheese of Christmas. And I thought <laughs> it's a better, and the more significant present than to offer a Mont Blanc pen or a wonderful uh, Vito uh, tie, because you only need money to buy this in order to offer it for Christmas. While my cheese, you cannot buy it. And my cheese is something very personal for me. And it, has, it makes sense because uh, it helps people to understand and to learn that the watchmaking art is born in farmhouses. So uh, cheese has become uh, a really a passion. And I'm very pleased that I love my cows, I love my farm, I love the farmer. Uh, and I feel, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it has become a real passion. One of the most informative things I know in my life has been the times when I've actually failed at doing something. It can be kind of a painful experience, but I find that I learn the most from it. Um, has there been anything that you've tried and and failed at? Oh, my biggest failure was probably when I sold uh, the brand Blanca. Uh, I had uh, that was in 1992. Uh, in 1992, I had some personal problems, and um, I lost courage. Uh, I lost hope, and I had a kind of depression. And I sold uh, the Blanc brand. Uh, and I was very attached to the brand. Uh, and I think this was a mistake because it Blanc could have been uh, somehow uh, a family brand. My kids, all my children are today passionate about watches. 
uh, they all more or less work in the watch business, uh, but it, it's not my, it's, they don't work with me and they don't work in my business. And I would have loved uh, to build a, a, a family business uh, for me and for my kids and for the kids of my kids. And that I didn't achieve. And that was a failure. And I didn't achieve it because I sold the brand. And uh, I got money, I got other experiences, but somehow it's something I still today regret. You lacked, you lacked a certain vision to see what it could have been? Yes, uh, and we had difficulties. It was difficult time, 1992. Interest rates were going up to seven, eight, nine percent. Uh, can you imagine? There was a crisis, uh, and I was alone a little bit, uh, and I, I got into a kind of panic or depression, and I couldn't see the, the horizon anymore. I couldn't see the sky, and I sold it. Do you see a bubble in what's happening now with the vintage market in Rolex and Paddock just exploding? I know you own some in your collection, but are you concerned that they're topping out right now? I don't see a bubble because I see more and more people uh, getting uh, aware uh, that a watch is not made necessarily to look at what type it is. And they realize uh that a watch is really a, a piece of art, and not only a piece of art, it's also a piece of status, and it tells you who you are. The watch gives uh, is talking to others. Depending which watch you wear, you can show status, you can show that you are strong or sporty or elegant. So the watch is a real communicating tool for others. And uh, uh, so today we are at the start. I don't think it's a bubble. Monday, one day it might become a bubble. But now so many people realize it. So we had a lot of people entering into that market, but they didn't enter a few years ago. It's all new people coming in. And uh, uh, with the development of the world, uh, with the development of wealth, with the development of uh, the, the uh, countries in, in, the, in the East, in the Far East, uh, in Russia, etc., it is normal that the demand is so big for vintage watches. I don't think it's a bubble. It might become one day a bubble, but not yet. There's so much uncertainty over the future of the industry as a whole. Can you tell us, what does your future for the watch world look like? I think we are going to have two, uh, we will go into two directions. We'll have the, uh, the technology, like the Apple Watch, which is a phenomenal technology. But somehow, the Apple Watch is a computer which you can put on your wrist. It's a copy of your computer, more or less. Uh, and it has the same functions. And that's the miracle. <laughs> it gives you also the same information as your computer. Um, so that is one side, and that is marked through strong technology, through huge innovations, uh, and big investments. And then you have <laughs> the other part where people are, are working with their fingers, uh, where they are making, you know, uh, maybe uh, certain brands are producing 10,000 watches, others 50, and then the leader, uh, like Rolex or Omega, they produce a little bit less than 1 million watches. But what's that for the world? 1 million for the world, that's really nothing. So uh, these pieces, they will remain as exceptional watches. They will remain not as a, a product to tell you what type it is, only it, they, they have another significant and they connect, as I said, to eternity. So you have, you will have the two sides, the art and the technology. And, and the what two... about the future of the watch world without Jean-Claude? You are a one of a kind. We've been talking to you. You have fans watching this right now. Who takes your place? If it's not someone in your family, as you said, who would you be mentoring now and what would you be teaching them? 
You know, the, 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 the boss of, of the biggest uh, and the strongest luxury Swiss watch brand is called Rolex. And uh, the boss is one of my best friends. And he has worked with me for, I don't remember, 12, 15 years. And I was his mentor. That's my proud that I have in the industry people uh, that are young now. They are 45 or something like that. I'm 73. Uh, and I have people uh, who have learned and who have been with me. And that tells me that I did a good job because these people developed extraordinarily well. I have also my son who is the the boss for uh, Hublot for Greater China, which means for China, Hong Kong, uh, Macau, and Taiwan. And uh, uh, he has made uh, Hublot, the, this part of the world, as the first Hublot market. And in 2014, uh, uh, 13, we were not existing in China. So I have people, friends around the whole industry. And in somehow, that's my legacy. That's what, you know, that makes me proud. And that tells me that I was useful uh, uh, for others. If I have been useful for me, okay, why not? But that's not important. What is important is what you, what you transmit, what you give back. The giving back is the most important in your life. So uh, I, have been I have been giving back uh, since I am 60. I tried really uh, uh, to act as giving back as much as possible. So the watch uh, industry uh, doesn't need me. Uh, <laughs> maybe I, was, uh, I played a little role uh, in the last century, but today my role is through my people. And my people are managing big brands or uh, uh, through the Swiss uh, in the Swiss watch industry, and that's my proud, and that is my that's my proof that I did a good job. Of all the remarkable people you've had an opportunity to work with, celebrity or otherwise, who do you think is the most interesting person that you've collaborated with? I think um, Mr. Arno. He's the big boss of LVMH. And I was really impressed uh, by his professionalism, by the fact that he goes into each detail, uh, uh, his generosity uh, and his openness. He's extremely open on new technology, on new uh, trends. Uh, he's an extraordinary modern guy. <laughs> uh, he's 72 years old but he is <laughs> extremely connected uh, to the future. Are most smart and guys at the top open-minded? Sorry, are, are, most open mi are most smart guys at the top open-minded listen to everyone? I think so. That's, uh, 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 how can you be open-minded when you don't learn and when you don't listen and when you, and when, uh, and when you don't look? I think the most important thing in life is to constantly connect to the future. And you can only connect to the future by listening and learning. And that means you have to be humble to still learn and to still listen and to still discover and need an inside curiosity. And very many people, when they get older, they lose curiosity. They lose the, the, the faculty of learning. They lose the listening. And they believe sometimes that they know. That's the proof that they are old when you start to believe you know. <laughs> and, and that has impressed me uh, uh, when, when I met for the first time Mr. Arnold. Yeah. You've worked with so many uh, amazing brands. Was it ever challenging to sort of switch gears? People tend to be very tribal and very loyal to their sports team or to their, you know, the car they drive or whatever it is. You know, when you're changing from these really big brands, LVMH, you know, Omega, Hublot, um, is that ever a challenge? No, because I always believed that I have one boss, and the boss is the brand. It means I always had to adapt to the brand. I never adapted the brand to me. And so I'm a kind of a servant. 
And so when I was at Omega, my boss was Omega. My boss was in the cemetery where all these people had worked, where the soul of the brand was. And it was, it was not my soul. And I was there to learn the Omega soul and then to reproduce it and then to, to uh, communicate it. So when you think that the brand is the boss, you are working for the brand and you are respecting the brand because he's the boss and you are, you are not changing the brand. You adapt to the brand. It's you. And when you see Karl Lagerfeld, he has do, been doing, I don't know exactly, but maybe 30 years, he has been designing Chanel. But every time at each collection, Chanel looked like Chanel. Chanel never looked like uh, uh, Karl Lagerfeld. And at the same time, he was working for Fendi. And you never thought that he would work for Fendi because every Fendi collection looked like Fendi and every Chanel collection looked like, Ch like Chanel. That was the genius of Karl Lagerfeld. Hey, we can't let you go without asking you to hold up your wrist and show us what you're wearing today. I, I told you, I'm wearing a prototype of a Minute Repeater. It's, it's, a, it's a neutral case. And the Minute Repeater, voila. It's See, 10 that's, that's a perfect and, example of what you were talking about because it sounded beautiful to you and we couldn't hear a thing over technology. <laughs> so you're absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> Hey, Jean-Claude, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we've enjoyed our time together. And thanks for joining us on the Accutron Show. Oh, bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Accutron Show. To listen to all of our shows, visit AccutronWatch.com. To learn more about the world of Accutron, follow us on Instagram at Accutron Watch and subscribe to our podcast. From New York City, until next time, Accutron Time.